before I got married, I wanted to interview some people, um, as many as I could to see what, not just what marriage was like, um, that wasn't really where my attention went. What I really wanted to know was what was the first year of being married like? And so what I did was I set out to interview uh, people, people who had been married and were divorced, people who I thought were probably in good marriages, people who I thought were probably not in good marriages, but they didn't necessarily tell me that. And so I went out and I interviewed um, men and women and I asked them, you know, what was the first year of marriage like? And... <laughs> Almost across the board, except for one person who was my brother-in-law, um, everyone said the first year was really, really tough, like really tough. And I was thinking, okay, um, that's not going to happen to me because Burgess and I know each other really well. We know how we're put together. We understand our faults and our foibles, uh, and we're going through a lot of change work. Uh, so I was like, okay, you know, the first year for other people of marriage is, is going to be tough, but not, but not for me. Um, and <laughs> the first year of my marriage was really, really difficult. Um, and I remember Burge, this was even before we were, maybe even before we were engaged. She said, you know, if two people stay committed, then anything can happen. Uh, and if they stay committed to the marriage and they stay committed to each other, then whatever comes up in life, they can work through and the marriage will be stronger on the other end. So for some people, that doesn't work out, right? There's infidelity or there's financial issues. I think 90% of the reason people get divorced is for financial reasons. Uh, but what it drives to is a, lo a loss of commitment. And that just got me thinking about what's been going on with gold recently and the future of gold and maybe the future of you and gold. And I'm thinking of that it really comes down to the committed or how committed someone is to this idea of what's going on in the world, what's going on with Western central banks, Western countries, what's happening with Eastern countries. And so I want to talk about this future of gold and really how are you committed to it? Are you committed to it? Or is there really more of a, a kind of a fair weather approach to it? And so the way I wanted to look at this was I actually wanted to search on Google and start to see like what, what were some trending search terms um, that have been coming up and on Google search, you can go back to 2004. So I just, I went back to the beginning and I wanted to search on fiat currency and there were three peaks or three spikes in fiat currency. Now I, I labeled two of them, but the first spike was at the very end of 2008 and it really spiked up very, very high, meaning people were really searching on Google, the term fiat currency. And then it's, then it peaked again in August of 2011 and it's peaking again today. So I thought, okay, this is interesting. And I'm going to show these on how they affected um, the price of gold in a minute. But I was like, okay, fiat currency has had two spikes for sure. And it's spiking again today. So then I wanted to look up euro breakup. I was just thinking of search terms. And, and the euro breakup search on Google absolutely peaked in November of 2011. And so my attention went to, well, how does that affect the price of gold. And so what I wanted to do was bring up a price of gold, a gold chart over those time periods, because in my mind, I know what gold did during those times, but I want to show you here. So the first one was fiat currency, which absolutely peaked in August of 2011. And at that very same time, the Swiss franc came, uh, pegged itself to the euro and gold peaked at $1,920 and crashed almost within, I think, within a month down to $1,550. So almost a $400 drop within about five weeks. The next one, that uh, the next search term that absolutely peaked out was the euro breakup. And gold had moved right back up off that $1,550 bottom in September of 2011 and went right back up to $1,800 literally about six weeks later. And then the peak of people searching for Euro breakup was absolutely hitting the search terms and gold fell again. In fact, it fell back down to 1550. I was like, this is, this is kind of interesting. And then I think something changed. And I think the powers that be, central banks, Western countries, they figured out that we got to get in front of this. 
And so they started suppressing and pushing down and manipulating and intervening the price of gold so they didn't have these huge peaks. And so they started that. So the next time these people, us, started searching for bank runs or defaults or Spanish banks or Portuguese banks, um, they could be kind of in front of the curve and already have suppressed down the price of gold. So when it rockets back up, it's moving back up from a much smaller base. And you can see here, if you are seeing this, but those terms, bank run, default, Spanish banks, those terms all peaked in May of 2012. I mean, really peaked out. But by that time, the central bankers of the West had pushed gold down right back down to that 1550. So when gold rallied right back up that $1,800, they had already done a lot of suppression on it. And then they started the suppression again, and knowing that there's going to be some more turmoil in front of them. And then fiat currency again peaked. But by this time, gold had already fallen from 1800 on its way down to 1550, which it did again. So we've had three times, and you count four times if you start with August of 2011, where gold was pushed down to 1550. And at the exact same time you had this, whether it's causation or not, you had huge spikes in people searching for fiat currency, euro breakup, bank run, default, Spanish banks, Greek banks, Cypriot banks. And so there's this huge mechanism going on to surprise, suppress the price of gold. So these alarms don't go off. And what's interesting about this whole time period, the term gold standard has been moving up and up slowly. More and more people are searching this term gold standard while gold has been moving between basically 1800 to 1550. And the reason I bring this up is because the paper price of gold, or we can just call it the price of gold, has been falling. But what's so interesting is the demand is going up. And this is not typical for the, you know, for, for, a long-term secular market to end, meaning to have such a divergence between the two, typically you'd see something slightly different or really different. But it's interesting that with the price falling, you'd think the demand would be falling too, but in fact, the exact opposite is going on. And that's true for silver and for the price of gold. When the price falls, the demand is going up even more and more. And this all leads to that the world is moving towards gold and not away from it. And even recently, uh, Bitcoins have come back in to uh, kind of the, the search term and people are searching for those again. And again, I think it's because fiat currency is spiking again in this, uh, the Google search terms. So the takeaway from all this is how much are you committed to this idea of protecting your wealth, even if every week or month or quarter, even every year, maybe even every two years, it hasn't given you that feedback loop that you want. And we are in another one of these kind of, you know, push downs, manipulations, interventions, right back down to 1550. Uh, and so this has been a very interesting six to 16 months for people, especially people who are new into owning gold. And if you are, my suggestion to you is continue buying bi-monthly. Think of it as collecting this. And in the next five years, when you look back, you'll be very happy that you did. This is something that we're going to talk about this coming uh, Tuesday, April 9th, with the, which is my semi-annual strategy gathering. We're going to absolutely talk about gold and real estate. In fact, I interviewed Bruce Norris. If any of you have been in real estate for more than, I don't know, a year or two, you absolutely know who Bruce Norris is. He's, Bruce Norris is. He is an evidence-based real estate investor. He has gotten the picture right so many times over the last two decades. Uh, he must have a crystal ball. And of course, we'll go over speed investing. And I will take all of your live questions, extensive Q&A. We'll update the strategies. We'll look over the market x-ray. And the biggest thing I can tell you, if you're doing this on your own, growing your money on your own, investing on your own, find a peer group that you can connect to so you don't have to. And that's why we started these strategy gatherings. Uh, going back to 2003. Thanks, from, th thanks so much for being here. This is RC Peck, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. You take care.